Um, hi, uh, my name is uh, Kirk Carlson, and I'm here with Paul Westerhoff, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, value creation and some uh, work that we've done together. Uh, Paul, can we start by you uh, describing, you know, who you are and your role at ASU and what um, some of our experiences have been? Right. So I'm Paul Westerhoff. I'm a professor at Arizona State University. I started here in 1995, so it's been a long time, and you know, by a lot of different metrics, I've been pretty successful, uh, you know, academically, um, you know, in terms of research. I've also, you know, been a department chair and a vice dean of engineering for research, uh, a vice provost at our university. And so I've been able to kind of experience kind of the administrative side of, of research as well and, and seeing what people across all different research fields uh, do. My specific area of expertise is in environmental engineering, and I deal with things uh, that are in water and how to get them out of water at their yep. health risk. And Paul, you're, you're interested not only in really fundamental research, but also the application of research, even up to um, working on new ventures and how you can get it out to the public. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and so our, our research does go from fundamental research all the way to kind of working with uh, industries and you know, about five or six years ago, we went through starting an engineering research center uh, that's funded by the National Science Foundation. And the, the purpose of these ERCs is to accelerate the pace of innovation and translation into commerce. Yeah. So we do work really closely with industry. And uh, I have started recently patenting things and a startup company. But before that, I was mostly <laughs> focused on writing journal papers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're you're a researcher who wants to actually make an impact with your research. You want to do fundamental research and write really fundamental papers, but you also want to get it out and have an impact on on real people, right? Yeah, I, I, I find that it's not just me. I, I really see this as a trend amongst yeah. a, a lot of engineering faculty members at you know um, all types of universities, uh, small private, uh, exclusive universities that more and more they, they care about different ways of getting their results out uh, other than yeah. just journal papers. Yeah, that, that, and that's what we see too. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a wonderful thing when you can do what you do, which is the fundamental research and change the way the world thinks about things, but also to see how uh, you can help real people. And, and you're working on things in the biological area that um, can save lives. So you um, you have a lot of motivation to, get, <laughs> to be successful. That's yeah, fine. <laughs> Yeah. So, Paul, how, how did we get to know each other? So, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we were uh, lucky to be one of three engineering research centers uh, funded right around 2015. And we were all really excited at the time. Uh, and, you know, the National Science Foundation brought these three new engineering research centers to Washington, D.C. There had been a long competition, over 200 pre-proposals, we did down to about 30 proposals. 10 site interviews, and we were one of the lucky three teams. And so we thought we were the cat's meow. We were really good. You know, we had we had survived the gauntlet and we were the best of the best. And then we met you, Kurt. Uh, so the, the National Science Foundation, uh, you know, I, I guess invited you to give a mini workshop for these three engineering research centers. And it was really the leadership of each of these centers that came to Washington, DC. And, uh, you know, you asked us about, uh, you know, how do you create value as your centers? And maybe we'll go into it, but uh, within a few hours, we realized that we knew nothing about creating value, even <laughs> though uh, we had won this competition, you had totally demoralized us at this point. No, oh no. <laughs> I said that's the, uh, that wasn't the end of the workshop. That was the, somewhere in the middle of the workshop. Okay, uh, good. Do you want me to describe how we felt at the end? Well, uh, you, you tell the story yeah. the way you, yeah. the way you feel so, comfortable. So, you know, what you did is you got up there and you asked uh, each of us in turn to kind of, you know, develop a value, you know, describe the, the value that our centers were going to add. And, uh, you know, if you even just think of the names of our center, the name of our center is Nano Enabled Water Treatment. Uh, one of the others, uh, um, Biogeotechnology. And so even the names of our centers were all about our approach. 
it, you know, and you know, everyone that got up there said what wonderful approaches and how unique everything that they were doing was. And I think what you taught us in a very concise way is a, a framework to think more about focusing on you know, kind of the need that's there and finding unique approaches that differentiate you from other things that are going on. And in that mode, you could probably be more successful over the course of, um, of the center. And so by the time we left and we had practiced this, this pitch several times, uh, it got dramatically better. And we actually walked away quite inspired. And over the last five years, we totally integrated it into the way that we run our center. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, we had a colleague, um, uh, Pedro, who did something quite remarkable during the, the, uh, the mini session we had together. Can you describe uh, what happened when Pedro stood up? Yeah, so, so Pedro Alvarez is the director of our center, and uh, he's a National Academy of Engineering member now. And he struggled giving the initial pitch for our center. Uh, but it was very easy for him to sit and, you know, clearly listen to other center directors try to give their pitches, but he could stand up and say it more succinctly, even though he was not an expert in the field. And uh, those other you know, center directors were really impressed. Uh, and, you know, I think what it says is that these pitches don't need to be overly complicated. Uh, and that they can be very kind of uh, clear and to the point and, and not to a lay person, but still get across the yeah. key innovations yeah. that uh, you know, lie behind yeah. some of these major investments in research centers. Yeah. So I, I um, you know, we asked Pedro uh, to give it the presentation for one of the other centers and Pedro is a really smart guy. He's a really nice guy too. And he listens actively. He's an active listener. He was actually really paying attention and so even though it was on the spur of the moment, he actually gave a value proposition for the other team where the room went silent after he was done. Mm -hmm. Because I think everyone in the room realized for the first time they could change the world. Mm -hmm. And Pedro had the advantage of, first of being a very accomplished person, so he has a lot of background, but he wasn't tied to the approach he was tied to the he was tied to the impact and the value they could deliver and so he brought that perspective and it illustrates one of the principles of the workshop we held together which is other people really can reframe things in ways to really to help us understand what we're doing and to think about it in a new more productive way you think that's yeah, fair? I, I definitely agree it definitely opened our eyes as a, as a center and you know, after that kind of uh, you know kind of eye-opening kind of experience, um, I know Pedro invited you to Rice University to run a workshop, and uh, I invited you to Arizona State University to run a workshop with our engineering faculty uh, members. Yeah, and so um, talk about that one a little bit. Um, so um, what happened when we um, ran that workshop together? So first, I'll, I'll start briefly with the outcome at, at Rice University. Um, not only did it was it kind of embraced by our center and other faculty there, but the department that Pedro's in has actually integrated it into their PhD uh, research proposal requirements. Um, but more so at Arizona State University, when you came and gave your value proposition or NADC proposition with, with Len, uh, we got together about 30 faculty and um, they were loosely organized around themes that um, I had picked as a vice dean for research and invited faculty. So it was a little bit targeted. I wanted to be sure that people were gonna be open-minded. This was kind of the, the first time for something like this. And uh, they had never really formulated work together, uh, but they had some nascent ideas on, on what they wanted to do, perhaps in a similar domain. And uh, you know, we, we went through the first day and it was great. And I think uh, the, the biggest kind of you know, sign that something important was going on is that uh, we didn't lose anyone on the second day. And, and for faculty to commit two days to something or a day and a half to something really says that uh, they're learning something along the way. Uh, and so we did you know, kind of this, these workshops where you get up and you give the pitches over and over. And I think 
you, the key is that you, you listen and it's, uh, you're not being knocked down. So you're asked to receive you know, comments from people and not respond to them. And I, I think that the first thing we learned at that workshop is it's okay to get comments and not be defensive and just to listen. So I think that was one big takeaway. Also how to give comments in a, in a kind of collegial way that you yep. know, says, tell me more about this as opposed to, I think you're wrong. Yep. Uh, so you know, reducing that, that confrontational level in terms of when you're building centers and teams were really important. I think uh, another key thing is that everyone thought um, it's pretty damn simple. You know, everyone had seen other frameworks and models for things. And this is just four things, need, approach, benefit, competition. Maybe it's a little bit more than that, you know, later, but it's pretty easy. Uh, and, and so I, I think the idea is everyone came away from this first workshop that we had um, with a lot of positive, you know, feedback for, uh, on the workshop. Um, one person bought you know, six copies of your book and books and have given it to their students and, and run his entire research group. And he's amazingly successful. You know, this is less than five years later, he started two companies uh, oh. and just is wildly successful. Other uh, faculty have integrated into graduate courses that they teach around how students should develop their research proposals. Um, and I think a lot of people were a little hesitant initially that this may only be for starting a company. But I think it was very clear at the end that this can really increase the, the value and success rates on writing proposals to any yeah. uh, federal you know, agency. Yeah. So the way we discuss it, it's value creation. It's not, uh, you do value creation before you do innovation, before you do ventures, before... And when you're doing research, it's all about the value. It's about solving real problems first. So we focus on that to begin yep. with because that's how they start. Uh, just very quickly. So the way this workshop runs is, um, as Paul said, we have five or six teams in the room. Uh, we teach them uh, just this one framework to start, the need, the approach, benefits per cost and competition, which is the definition of a value proposition. They're the most four basic questions you can ask they're basically what uh, a good research paper will address those four questions. Maybe not in those words, but nevertheless, uh, that's what happens. And then we have the team stand up and present for two or three minutes, and then they get feedback from multiple points of view. What was good? Don't forget that. Uh, what could be improved? Eyes of the funder, eyes of the end user, uh, different perspectives, all very positive. Negatives, <laughs> this is not about negative. This is about everybody getting better and learning and improving faster. So, and over the course of two days, they'll stand up seven or eight times and give this these very quick presentations, as Paul said, being quiet. So they listen because you want them to be active listeners while they're getting the feedback. So when they sit down, the team can then work on it again. And over the course of the two days and the eight presentations, we keep on adding additional ideas how to remove risk, how to do various things. Um, so by the end of the workshop, they've got a pretty good idea of, well, in this case, they were mostly on research grants. They were, we were basically helping them improve their research grants. They weren't forming ventures. Uh, one of them was thinking about it, mm -hmm. uh, but it was really about how do we do a really better job at our research. So, and and then, I think that the, the key thing that you know, faculty recognized is that a lot of what they were trying to do was very approach driven. And that what they said their need was, was not actually connected to what their approach was. It was yeah. a very lofty, ill-defined yeah. need. And uh, I know at least one of the teams by the end of the workshop, actually you know, by defining the need, they changed their, what their research was gonna be on. Uh, in terms of that, there was one key step that they needed to understand better uh, to really, you know, have the impact that they want. And uh, that person has gone off and, and also been quite successful in getting grants in that specific area. Wow, uh, great. Because great. it was a very unique area, uh, it turned out. So. so can you describe a little bit the first presentation from the last one, and then we followed up again? Um, sure. And what? I mean, the, the first, it's, you know, after I think I've been through these workshops now, maybe four or five times. Um, and, and one is they're, they're engaging, they're fun. Um, you know, Kurt, you and Len or whoever you're doing it with, 
Uh, you don't do too much lecturing, which is nice. Uh, and there's a lot of examples from uh, experience in the past. Uh, maybe a few too many that work, and maybe some more that don't work would be nice, and why they <laughs> fail would be nice. But, um, you know, so I, I think, you know, the, the first time faculty, you know, get up and, and give their presentation, um, you know, they jump right to the approach and uh, usually describe something in, you know, some weird, bizarre detail that may be relevant to five or 10 people in the world somewhere. Maybe there's some something interesting in there. But it, it was really clear that people were doing things that were of interest to them and not necessarily important things for um, creating value or doing something that would have a, a bigger impact uh, in their overall work. And, and so I think it was really focused on interest of what they wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. So we call those big A's. They're all about the person's approach, but not really the, the need and the impact they could have um, from the success of their work. Although what we normally form at these, or rather see at the end is that most of the people really do have the chance to do something significant. They might have to pivot a little bit uh, as you gave your example, but, um, but nevertheless, these are, these are very smart people, right? Yeah. That, that's, yeah. not, that's not the problem. Yeah. So, um, so I would tell you, um, you know, we've, we've worked with about 500 teams. Uh, no team has ever actually been able to describe their need when we get started. So you, you said the framework is simple, but it's, it's not easy to do, is it? I mean, just, just those four questions. How hard is it just to answer those four questions? So it, it is difficult, right? And, and so I think one of the challenge, and we've done this workshop a second time a few years later at ASU with another group of faculty, and it was a little bit easier, but I think over that day and a half, um, you know, these four ideas of need, approach, benefit, and competition, I think once people, and the kind of what's intuitive or easy about it is that, um, you need to have a common language in order to be talking about these things. And once you have a common language, even if you don't understand, you know, some, you know, um, ion propulsion system for deep space, you can still, you know, listen as, as someone and, and hear about it. And so the evolution of these kind of pitches, you know, are also learning a, a common language of, of how and things that should be there. I mean, to me, some of the key takeaways are you should have metrics for things, not just things are, are bigger, smaller, you know, uh, and, and trying to understand why is bigger better, right? Um, and what does better mean, right? So there's a, a few of these things that become kind of um, just terminology, but they're easy to pick up because they're intuitive. Yeah. And then they really do last with people for a while. So yeah. at, at our university, we've done this a second time uh, with, I, I think, uh, another a different group of faculty. It's been equally as successful. Um, we got a, a large grant from a, a, an international foundation, and uh, it's to really focus on kind of TRL, you know, one and two. And we have them submit proposals to get this funding using this value creation. And every six months, they have to come back and give their pitch again. And our board <laughs> gives them feedback in this positive you know, way. And so we find it to be uh, very non-confrontational. As an administrator, I've also used it to work with individual faculty developing centers or pitching centers within our university for seed funding. And even faculty who haven't taken the workshop in a very short amount of time, I can convey this idea because it's pretty simple concepts to them. And we would just iterate back and forth, not on a 30 slide slide deck, which is what I was getting initially. <laughs> in the end, one slide in two or three minutes. And by the end, they could convey the entire purpose of their center. Uh, and for one faculty member, we, we did this and I floated it up into our, our upper administration, it sat on somebody's desk and they funded it three months later because it was such a, a good idea. And wow. so it wasn't, if I had sent them the 30 slides, it would have never gotten you know, initiated yeah. at that level. So, so that's one of the principles that we've discovered over time. I wrote a Harvard Business Review article about the connection between the value creation and the learning science. And so when you're dealing with complex problems, which is what, we were doing together, all the research you're doing is very complicated. Um, 
Um, you want to start off with the fundamental questions first, and then you can keep on adding concepts as you go along. And if you get the fundamentals wrong, just those four questions, it sets you off in the wrong direction. And that's why they pivot oftentimes. And if you're, but oftentimes pivoting means you lose because it costs you money, it costs you time. So yeah, so the concepts um, are, I think are very fundamental, um, but they're easy to remember, which is one of the principles. Because if, if you have a methodology where there are 13 or 14 things you have to remember, that won't work with the kind of people we hang around with. They just won't do that. It's gotta be really, you know, basic stuff. So everything you, you were doing, your teams were doing, and with the NSF grant are multidisciplinary, if not interdisciplinary. And the, the trick today is if you wanna solve big important problems is you need to put together those multidisciplinary teams. And if there's no way to get the teams together to share those ideas, it can't work. And I would say that's the biggest opportunity I see in universities is to use a methodology like this, which is fundamental, simple to understand, but still fundamental, that getting people together, I think could be transformative for US research. I don't know, what do you think about yeah, that? I mean, you're not the only one, you know, NSF calls this convergence science. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, so, you know, we recently won one of these convergence grants and there's a, a phase one and a phase two. So ultimately I think four to $5 million. And uh, the goal of the first phase is not to actually, the goal of the first phase uh, is to demonstrate that you've converged. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of silly <laughs> in, in a way. No, but I can tell you that, that our team, we have a, an economist, uh, two sociologists, uh, a geospatial analyst. Yep. Uh, I'm the token engineer. And I don't know, we have a few other ologists in there. And we, one of them is, a, is a, you know, studying us uh, as a sociology you know, yep. thing in terms of thinking about what is our lexicon? Do I understand the terms that you use? And so yes. it, it is there. And I've been trying to bring this NABC approach to, to yes. this you know, kind of broader group. Um, and we haven't quite gotten there yet. We're only two months in. Uh, okay. But it, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of language and, and uh, terminology yes. sometimes. So I, I think that these convergence or yes. really interdisciplinary ideas uh, do have. I'd say the only reason we, we won this award is that it wasn't because we had a great approach. We actually, reading the proposal again, we had no approach. <laughs> but what we had is a very clearly defined need. Yes. And this need for us was around, um, you know, how people in these, they're called colonias, kind of unincorporated communities, share water, get and share water. Yes. And, and we found this, this thing that's important. Um, it's a documented important need for yes. health outcomes and, and education and other things. Um, but no one has kind of solved it. Um, so uh, it, it truly is coming together around a common problem or need. And now we're trying to figure out what the approach is. So, so Paul, I think that's brilliant. I absolutely think that's brilliant. And I think that's exactly the right thing because what you've done is to find a really big important problem, put together a multidisciplinary team, um, but with a simple framework again, and begin to develop the ideas. And that one idea is, is really part of what transformed SRI when I was CEO. So for example, you know, we did Siri. Siri is an interdisciplinary um, solution to a really, really hard problem. And why is it that SRI could beat IBM by seven years? Little SRI, I mean, not, not that small, but medium size. The reason was we did exactly what you just described around a big important problem. We kept on bringing our teams together using this um, innovation for impact I for I framework to share the ideas to eventually put the solution together. And most people don't do this. Uh, one other point about that for the NSF, we also did a, a series of studies with the, um, with the center grants. And again, brilliant people, important problems, but the one thing that was limiting their performance was the ability to share ideas. Individually, there were, you know, there were four or five teams. Individually, they were, they were great, but they weren't going to solve the big important problem unless they collaborated with a level of intensity that really has been unknown 
in most universities. I mean, there are professors, there are people like you, they get this and know what to do, but it's rare. And I think if the one big, the one big virtue of this virus is everyone is now online and there really is now a mechanism to collaborate more effectively. So, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I think, again, we've embraced this kind of value creation idea within our engineering research center. Yeah. And I, I know personally, you know, that my success rate on grants has, has gone up. But I think, you know, it's the students that come through the center, the graduate, I mean, our center is wildly successful. You know, we have over 400 publications uh, from, you know, from a, a, right. an academic output, it's great. And right. we're producing students, but these students are, are winning competitions. Um, they're winning pitch competitions. They're getting faculty jobs. They're yeah. starting companies. They're getting hired by Google and mm -hmm. Google doesn't do much on water. Uh, and, and so it's really just the fact that the students going through this can clearly articulate, yeah. um, you know, the problem that they were addressing yeah. and their approach. And, and for us, these are always approaches that involve more than one group. Yeah. Uh, so they had to work with other students yes. uh, to, to solve the problem. So that is, that is the future um, big opportunities around the world. We don't lack for opportunities, but they're, most of the big ones are interdisciplinary. You know, you look at SpaceX or Tesla's autonomous car or, um, or health, uh, the, the new uh, um, vaccine that just came out. They're all multidisciplinary. So, um, you know, it's funny um, when people ask me, you know, what are the three things you've got to do to make this be successful? And I, you know, I, I, I exaggerate a little bit and I say there are only three things. Uh, the first is work on important problems, not interesting ones. And you just gave a brilliant example of your team uh, working with NSF to, to tackle a big important problem. Uh, the second is to have a common language based on the fundamentals, because otherwise, because all these different teams you've brought together speak different languages, right? But the one language they should have because they're working together is the language of uh, delivering value to their stakeholders, to end users, to society. So uh, if you give them that language, it just, you know, it's like everything else, it speeds it up. And the third thing is having regular meetings where you actually share the knowledge of your team together, the genius of your team. If you can tap into the genius of your team, um, usually they will figure it out. And to do that in a positive, constructive way is really essential because human values are, are at the, the core of everything you and I do um, in terms of value creation and innovation. So those, those, uh, those three things, important problems, common language, NABC value propositions, and recurring team-based feedback and iteration. So Paul, um, uh, anything else? Um, what yeah. else comes to mind? Have we forgotten anything? Yeah, I mean, th there are other models out there like this. Um, and I think that these are complementary rather than you uh -huh. know, having to choose. I mean, yeah. so uh, I've had faculty in engineering at our university um, and students in my own group who have done i for example, and they've done uh -huh. your workshop. And so I think they're, they're complementary, right? Yeah. Um, I think it gives you a lot more insight into why you're doing i why you're talking to yes. end users um, and what it is. And, and i teaches you how to listen to, to those end users and not telling them your approach. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I think it's useful to hear what these, the way iCorps does it, it really fills in around the need and the competition and potential benefits. Yes. Um, and, but I think, you know, kind of the NABC approach then allows you, you know, as you go kind of beyond just how to give the two minute yeah. pitch, how to really, you know, be sure that your approach is answering the right questions. So I think, you know, a lot of these things are complementary, but they all inform each other. and. Um, that's, that's one of the things I, I don't know how, how you think thought about it, but it's one of the feedback I get from a lot of faculties. Why should I do one or the other? And to me, anytime I go to any of these, like you said, it's not a large time commitment. And anytime I go through this idea of listening to other people flounder initially and then help you know them advance their ideas, it gets me thinking about how I can advance the ideas yeah. I care about. And it is easy to think about them internally, but it is useful to verbalize them. 
Yep. Um, and then, you know, seeing other people struggle allows you to remember kind of where you're making the common mistake. Yep. So you just made another uh, really important point, Paul, I want to emphasize, which is um, there, there are a whole series of different models because there are different stages that you go through when you develop innovations. For example, um, a venture is a different pitch from a license, which is a different pitch from a uh, iteration, a, a new product inside of a company. So the reason we focus first on the value proposition is that's the basis for everything else. It's mm -hmm. the basis for i it's the basis for Lean, it's the basis for STUM, it's the basis for Six Sigma. And if you don't get that right, and you jump, we see people jumping all the time, um, it uh, doesn't work. You've got to create the value proposition first. So that, to us, that's the fundamental part. And then we use whatever methodology is appropriate, design, um, venture, you know, once you figure out where you're going, then you use the next right model. And those are all part of what we teach as well. So this has been great. Um, Paul, if, if everybody just did some of these really fundamental things, I mean, we're talking about really kind of basic stuff, right? Focus on important problems, have a common language, get together, share ideas, be positive, have great human values. I mean, this isn't exactly uh, quantum mechanics, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, how much how much additional impact do you think we could make if people systematically did those three things? So I, I think I think there's two levels of impact. So first I'll talk, you know, that from my perspective, we're at a university and we do produce, you know, undergrad students, we produce graduate students. Yeah. You know, I had an undergraduate student that worked in our lab and in our center for a year, and she just won a half million dollar Tata X Prize. Uh, and she credits, not me, she credits the grad students in my group who taught her how to develop a value proposition, right? So the, the biggest product is not, um, you know, us getting more money, but it's yes. getting money that supports these students who then kind of go off and, and teach others. Exactly so, right. but I, on the, the kind of more selfish side, you know, I think um, my success rate has gone up and it's a little hard to, to understand the metrics of, of everyone across you know entire engineering college other than you know testimonials and uh, from people who say this has really helped me and it's helped you know people say this not just in writing grants but in writing more clear and concise journal papers that get accepted faster uh, because they're just the the novelty of what they're doing is yeah. more succinct so I, I think some of these things are, are a little bit hard to follow as, as metrics but I've heard no one say that was a waste of time. Well, so in the, the workshops we've done, both at ASU and with other universities that we've done together, yeah. um, is it fair to say that not one faculty member has been able to succinctly, quantitatively describe their project when they start? Absolutely. The, the first, you know, you know try and, and a value you know, propositions all over the place. It's in their head, it's very clear in their head, but uh, they don't know that they're telling it to someone who is smart, but not exactly in their expertise. Yes. Um, so, and it definitely improved, you know, I, I think it takes at least three iterations and then you see just huge improvements. And if you can get to the time commitment to do four or five iterations, I think, the idea has gotten, has transformed and actually the idea has gotten better. Yeah. So uh, just, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've done 500 of these. Uh, typically, um, in our, our use companies as an example here, 75% of what they're doing has no value for anybody. Um, and they decide this, we don't decide this because we do, all we do, we do is we give them the framework that we're talking about. And by the end of the two-day workshop, typically 75% of them go away and all of them change direction. All of them change direction because essentially all of them are focused on their approach and not on the real need. And until you know the real need, you don't know which direction to go into. So just, you know, it sounds like a simple thing, but it's a really profound one. So I actually, my, my belief after doing this hundreds and hundreds of times is if people did those three simple, simple conceptually things, important problems, 
and being focused on the, the real the real problem, have a sh shared language and a systematic, whether it's every two weeks or every four weeks, that hardly matters. It's the standing up on a regular basis and getting the feedback. I think we could double the effectiveness of our research in America. And I think the impact would be more than double. And my proof of that is other research labs, but certainly SRI, where we went from failing for 20 years to growing three times and creating about $100 billion of new value by systematically um, creating innovations like high definition television, intuitive surgical, the leading robotics company, um, and Siri that we all know, uh, which we bought by Steve Jobs. I actually don't think this is a little thing. I think this is a really big thing. And I think in particular, uh, universities, um, because collaboration is so difficult there, I think even a modest additional um, use of the concepts you described, focusing on a big important problem, assemble a really compelling, you know, multi interdisciplinary team, and then have a way to keep on iterating to develop the value proposition. I really think that's a transformative idea. I don't think that's a little idea. I think that's a really, really big idea. Yeah, these are pretty easy to convey to junior faculty. So we did this as, a, as uh -huh. the, again, the vice dean for research and engineering. And uh, we did this with our uh, young investigator awards and our NSF uh, career, you know, uh, proposals. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, when we were there for about three years in a row, we were, you know, our university was in the top three nationally for the number of career, NSF career awards uh, that we were getting. And uh, it was a very simple process. We started early and really asked them yeah. these, these basic questions. We didn't do the full workshop with them. But, uh, you know, when you're sitting on, especially on these career panels, um, you might have one person who kind of knows your area. Right. Otherwise, you're really trying to lay out a career, right? Not just a research project. And the uh, the panelists really view it as a, as a career, and you really need to convey the idea rather than every little minutia of your of your approach. And so, so uh, what we've learned is very few people can do this by themselves. They really need right. that input from others. And as you point out, again, it's you're not asking them to learn, you know, the Oxford English uh, Dictionary of concepts, right? It's a few fundamental things that they intuitively get. Um, and all we're trying to do is give them a little bit of a framework so they can learn those things faster and learn from their colleagues. So, no. well, Paul, listen, um, this is great. Thanks for your feedback. Anything else? One last thought? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, thanks for kind of, you know, taking me on this journey, uh, you know, through these. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of benefits and again, it's, uh, it's fun to be part of these workshops and for both get criticism constructive criticism or whatever you call it as well as provided so it's really good as someone you know kind of in the workshop you tell something or you give a suggestion to a person one time you see them do it again and they put their twist on on addressing that and you're like you got it now i know what you mean yep. so it, it is fun participating as well as uh, being in there so thanks well you and i both had a magic moment when pedro stood up and gave the value proposition for another NSF center and the room went silent because yeah. they were stunned yeah. at the impact that that had. So thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for the great work you do and uh, uh, for your students and for the university. It's, uh, you're doing a terrific job, thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.